well. Well, 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 well. Uh, we are joined in studio. Introductions aren't my favourite part of this show, Dan, but we are joined in person by... I was thinking about what what this... Don't you laugh. Don't start laughing because people can see you, so it's not like this big reveal, Nat Medhurst, you're here. But I think this is the equivalent. We've done a lot of AFL guests. This is the equivalent of... Certainly not in looks or stature, but Jason Dunstall, that sort of Huge. player. We have a <laughs> yeah. we have a top we have a top we have a top ten player of all time in their sport in the studio. Nat Medhurst joins us. How are you, mate? I'm good. Jason, Jason Dunstall. Dun- wow. <laughs> Everyone, anyone ever compared you to Jason Dunstall before? This is a first. Okay. Is um, a first. It, you are our first lady guest. Yes. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Great job on ticking that box. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly right. I love that your attitude's like, look at these idiots. Oh, yeah, we've got a girl in. Great. You're done now. <laughs> now, I, I just want to roll off some stats here. I will do you an intro. So um, you played across four clubs in multiple, <laughs> multiple netball competitions, I might say. Netball, we're going to touch on this a bit later, but for mine, like looking at it from afar, I'm like, what is going on? Like what, what competition have you played in? Anyway, you played <laughs> club netball across – you played – for Australia, uh, 86 caps you had. Um, you won three back-to-back world championships, a three-peat. You're a gold medalist in the Commonwealth Games. Uh, you, in terms of those 86 caps, you are top seven ever to have done that. I think you're seventh on the list. Um, what am I missing here? You're just an absolute <laughs> gun of your sport, a genuine gun, and we are very happy to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's Great setup. Good to finally get to have a chat. Uh, you are the. Pa- I've got to address this off the top now. <laughs> we've got the first question we ask everyone, but you are the partner of Samuel Butler, who is a founding father of Back Chat. It's very good to have the higher performing sports person <laughs> in that family on this podcast. Yeah, he's. Do you ha- want to give him a swipe on the way through? Yeah, so? he's hating me at the moment. He's useless. Um, I think. Slob is probably a good word to use him at the moment um, to refer to him. But no, um, it's nice to claim that title. So I'll, I'll run with it. Nat, Her- Nat Medhurst, partner of Slob Sam Butler to start the, <laughs> the show. Slob. Now, the first question we ask every guest we ever have on this, and I asked you if you knew what this was. So it shows you're a big fan of back chat because you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the greatest spawning moment you've ever had. Now, I've just told you about your netball prowess. Don't want to hear it, unfortunately. We know you're a great netballer. Mm. We've we all w- played netball. Yeah, we've all, well, yeah, well. <laughs> you, you, I, I, I have. You're yeah. a mixed netballer, yeah. I know you are. <laughs> we want to hear your greatest sporting achievement not on the netball court. You oh. can't have netball. Okay, that's too easy. Oh, yeah, I've won a Commonwealth game, gold medal. Oh, yeah, cool, Nat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> world championships. Oh, well, la di da. So what? We want to know, and I'm, I'm padding and pausing for you here. I know your mind's sick thinking. What's your greatest ever sporting achievement? Not on the netball court. Um, oh, first of all, I do listen back to you. I didn't realise this was the first question straight off because you, you've got your big cricket one, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. amongst others, that's just the one that everyone wants to talk <laughs> that's about. That's the first person that's ever known about that. So she knows <laughs> that. Oh, that's I, I, yeah. um, we love that. I. Oh, I'll, I'm going to say it's still true. I'm going to roll with it that yeah. I hold a state school high jump record under nines, a metre 30. I don't think I could do that now. Uh, I've got to ask, was it the traditional Fosby oh, flop oh, or yep. you scissoring it? No, I was a flopper. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. High jumper. I reckon that's the second or third high jumper we've had on. What's Tom Hawkins with? was a yeah. high jumper. What are, you, high jump. what are you doing? What? I don't know. You were Just a basketballer growing up, were you? I Not was. Yeah, no, but I did a little aths and basketball, so I wasn't a massive fan of netball. Growing up, but yeah. So was it a state champion, high jump? It was state schools, yeah, okay. in SA. Okay, huge. Happy with that, Dad? Yeah, that's like as tall as I am, so that's big. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. So as I said, growing up, you didn't start playing netball till you in year seven. It's like yeah. late, late to you. It is. Well, particularly now, um, because they have netball, generally most of them started about five. Um, as I said, I didn't really enjoy netball I wasn't keen on it but growing up in the country you play everything so I was little athletics basketball um that's probably where my big passion was I thought I was going to go to America meet Michael Jordan play basketball that was going to be my thing I that none of that happened yes um even played a bit of cricket um when I was growing up and then yeah just started playing school netball in year seven 
because my friends were, and so yeah, it was probably a bit later than normal. What? So would you describe yourself as a like a tomboy growing up? Like, oh, like massive we, women's sport tw- twenty years ago. It's not what it is now. No, right? no. Nah. And so, what's that like going through school? You're clearly a sports person, but you know, people didn't accept it twenty years ago. Yeah, I remember I was an absolute tomboy. I have older brother, two younger sisters, um, and just for me, wanting to try and keep up with my brother was what I always wanted to do. Um, recess and lunch at school was always generally out at the basketball court with the boys or kicking the footy, playing cricket. Um, still the same in high school, got called a tomboy, all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, it was just something I just loved doing, running around, um, yeah, playing sports. So it's certainly a lot different now. And I think the obviously, as you're saying, with, net, with women's sport, there's so much more to play. Um, yeah. And it's just sort of starts all the way from when you first start school. You, you weren't always living the elite lifestyle though, Nat. You no. grew up in a family <laughs> that owned a pub. Yes. And your daily intake of food was usually pub for <laughs> breakfast, pub meal for lunch and pub meal for dinner, correct? Pretty much, yep, yep. I've done my research yeah. here, Nat. <laughs> Fairfield but, Palmies. But yeah, Budsy's been um <laughs> forget pan feeding you all the info. Yeah, um yeah, great. no, grew up in a pub. So mum and dad owned a pub. Um they own the where? Somerset Hotel in well they actually own one in Victoria where I was born. You're um, a Victorian. Don't, yes. um, don't put that under your breath. You're yes. a Victorian. Victorian, born in Victoria, small country town called Warwickneyville. Um they owned a pub there, the Royal Mail. I think there's about four pubs for um, in four the town people, yeah. for about four people. <laughs> and then we moved to Millicent, which is a small town near the Vic border near Mount Gambier. So it's about four hours southeast of Adelaide. Um, they own the Somerset Hotel. So we lived in the pub. Um, they owned it. So wow. it was good fun. But yeah, it was pub meals. Did you, is that much your all first the time. job? Like working in the pub? Oh yeah, working in the pub. Yep. So um, working in the kitchen. I swear my brother, he was working behind the bar. <laughs> Illegally, pulling pints. <laughs> yeah, pulling pints, <laughs> or I'm um, in the bottle. So yeah, it was good fun. Those yeah. kids, you just used to um, go go wild. So if you start playing netball in year seven and you've you've be, you've played a lot of sport growing up, when when does it become like I want to be a netball or I want to be a sports person? Like I, I want to play sport for a living. Um, to be honest, it actually probably wasn't really something that sunk in or that I really wanted to do until I was probably about 18 or 19. Wow. Um, I didn't – growing up in the country, I was very – I remember I was called laid back. Uh, I was so laid back, I was horizontal. So I just sort of <laughs> – no idea what was going on. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and then when we then moved to the city, so we moved to Adelaide when I was about 15 or 16, and that's when netball, um, I guess, sort of started to take over. But even then, because I wasn't exposed to – elite netballers or elite sport like kids are now growing up in the country it wasn't something really that I was driven to try and achieve um but yeah and I just sort of then went through and then when I was about 18 19 and um I was with the SA uh, SASE so the SA Sports Institute um and then Mar Gangove who was the head coach there and also head coach of the Adelaide Thunderbirds then said oh why don't you come out and do a pre-season and then I thought oh, this isn't too bad um, yeah, and then thought, oh, maybe this might be all right. So this is 2004, 2003, 2004. Yeah, around then. So yep. 2004, you debuted for Adelaide Thunderbirds. You played for the Thunderbirds, you played for the Firebirds, <laughs> you played for the Magpies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you like birds. <laughs> uh, so you played for the Queensland Firebirds 2010 to 2013, West Coast Fever 2014 to 2018, Collingwood 2019 to 2020. So four clubs across three different competitions, yep. I think. Yep. So we'll get back to the start again, but – How's all that happened with netball? I mean, it's, it's it hasn't been this strong single competition with you playing for one club for your entire career. It's been a journey. Oh, God, yeah. Um, well, I guess when I first started Adelaide Thunderbirds, as you said, it was a Commonwealth Bank trophy. So that was the first league I was a part of. Yes. Um, and I never thought that I was, would leave Adelaide. Um, so I played there for six years and then um, me leaving wasn't, my decision that was the clubs or i say the head coach at the time um can we not move on can we talk about that so oh uh, yeah like you were you were playing for australia at the time yeah when that happened yeah and you were contracted and you were what sacked what, what, but, what is it? well i was out of contract um and then i was told i wasn't a priority player for the club 
um, and you're Australia, you for Australia. Yeah, Australia. So that was 2009, um, end of the 2009 season. So then, yeah, 2010, I then moved to the Queensland Firebird. So that was pretty hard to take. And it wasn't nice because um, my life within the club was made quite um, horrible. Mm. Um, so it there was um, – which was started by the coach, like rumours, just um, – Turning players against you and all of those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, it wasn't a fun thing to sort of, um, I guess, be forced out of what I saw was my home at the time. Do you look back at that uh, with a positive mindset, moving to a club that maybe appreciated or accepted you more than yeah, given that you finished at Adelaide and they're treating you like shit? Like, <laughs> is, it, is it good to move on then, uh, you know, see you later? Like... I'm going to continue playing for Australia. I'm going to continue being a champion of the game. Yeah. Um, it was – obviously, at the time, it was pretty hard. Um, I then moved to Queensland. Um, my then partner at the time, he stayed in Adelaide. So, that I was up there on my own for the season, which that was a bit to na- navigate. But um, going to the Queensland Firebirds, the coach at the time, um, Rosalie Jenke, she was a new coach as well. Um, she was also assistant coach with the Australian Diamond. She was phenomenal. Um, just complete chalk and cheese between the two mm. coaches. Um, also, the shooting coach at the Queensland Firebirds was a lady called Nicole Cusack, who was a former Australian player. Um, and just working under them and the environment was, yeah, it was. It was really quite refreshing, but it was still, I think, the stuff that happened at Thunderbirds, um, unfortunately, probably triggered a few mental health then issues, and yeah. um, which was then things that amongst, whilst I was enjoying my netball, a whole lot of other things that were then sort of going on underneath. It seems crazy that that can happen in a professional sporting organisation, that sort of stuff. Um, Yeah, but unfortunately it happens all the time and I think what made it even sadder is um, what happened to me at Thunderbirds then happened to other players in the years that then followed. Um, And yeah, I remember when it happened to me at the time and talking to some players and they obviously didn't understand it or didn't realise exactly what had happened and then it happened to them. Mm. Um, and so now there's like this little, <laughs> little group. Welcome <laughs> to the club. Yeah, welcome to the club. That's pretty much what it was like. And I know then even being at Collingwood, um, then there's players or even staff members there that have gone through the same thing with the same individual. So the That's the crazy. club still wow. – that, that group or <clears throat> club, as you're saying, is um, still growing. Uh, if we keep to the start of your career, was it financially viable to be a netballer? At <laughs> you no, what, what were those I, know, days, I don't know. No, so I'm still, I think I know, but I've still got my first contract from 2004. Um, it was $1,000 I was paid to Again. play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. Um, <laughs> um, no, for the season. $1,000. $1,000 was this, was the signing. Um, I was then, you were then given a match fee, which I think for me it was $125, but you only got that money if you paid more than, played more than a half of netball that you Gosh. got that. Um, then the contract also outlines things like um, you got two pairs of shoes. So this is what was, obviously now as play, elite players, that's just a given or you've got your own personal yeah. contracts with brands or whatnot um but that was built into your contract that you got physio that you got a gym membership to be able to do your weights and your training you were given x number of rolls of strapping tape wow Um, yeah it's um you you look at it now and obviously from yeah from where we were to where the players are now and it's yeah you just can't believe that's what it was like was there a facility like did you have a did you have a training base yeah so netball um SA were really lucky that they had their own facility. I um, can't remember what it's called now. It's Netball SA Stadium yeah. <laughs> um, or Good. something inventive. Um, yep. Um, at gyms we used to use wherever we could, whether it was a recreational gym or sometimes um, Sassy. I know then Adelaide Thunderbirds also had an alliance with Port Power, so we'd sometimes train out there. Um, but, yeah, so a lot of netball clubs – don't have their own facilities or their own court, so they have to hire the hire them out. Still now, yeah, professional or uh, yeah. So I think the Melbourne, I, I believe the Melbourne Vixens don't own their own venue yet, so they're still technically hiring that out to train at the State Netball Centre. What sort of 
in comparison, okay, you got paid a thousand dollars, which is just crazy. So I assume you had you had to have another job. Yes. Yeah. So how many hours were you required to be thunderbirding, like an, a week? Um. So it's. <sighs> Oh, I'm just trying to think what we were doing. We we're probably still doing. You wouldn't be doing around anything less than what you would have done for your career, would you? I mean, just pay less. Yeah, to be honest, it was probably a little bit less um, because girls. There was more of an emphasis on girls having to work or do study. Um, so you were generally training either first thing in the morning, and you were getting out by sort of seven thirty, eight o'clock, so that girls were able to get to work, um, or then training. After hours from like six to eight thirty, nine o'clock, or whatever, a bit to almost similar to what AFLW were doing now. Yeah. So we were more like that when I first started. Whereas now, what, when um, did that change? Oh. Um, it changed. Oh, probably when the AN, when it became the ANZ Championship. I think it really started to shift in terms of that um, professionalism and the increase in dollars and all of that sort of thing. So when we merged with the New Zealand league yes um that's when it really started to change and more money started to come in so it's basically like you you have a full-time job you fit in netball when you can around it yep yep oh. pretty much and uh, right now is is every player in the league full-time or would, would there still be players running around now that have secondary jobs to, um, to finance themselves yeah no there's definitely girls who still work um the minimum wage is Around the well, bit under forty grand. Is that like a rookie? Like a, um, like a no, and it's not. Some girls that are on that if they've been in the system for a couple of years. Right. Um, so and they're they're twelve month contracts. So um, yeah, can't there's survive on thirty grand. Yeah. So there's girls now who are still trying to work or study, um, but it's hard because initially in our the players agreement we used to have the hours between 10 to 4 blocked off so that girls could study and work um now clubs they have to ask their players but they say oh well rather than bookending your days with training we'll are you happy to train longer in the day so you might be there so i know at collingwood we were often there at um training might start at say 6 30 in the morning you're not getting out till one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so that then becomes quite difficult to actually properly do any form of employment or study around that. What were you doing for a job at the time? Um, so I worked, when I first started, um, I did. A, there was a couple of different jobs that I did across those first few years. So um, one was in retail. I also worked with Netball SA as a junior development officer. Um, also, I was there for a little bit as a receptionist. But um, yeah, so... Yeah. Particularly working in netball was when I first started was good because obviously they're aware of what your career or you know what else is going on and can manage things if you needed to. So you win your first world championship in two thousand and seven. So you debut two thousand and four. You play for Australia and win your first of three in a row two thousand and seven. You Correct. make me like I'm wrong. I'm no, like, you're right. Like, no, I'm right here. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so you go from getting a thousand dollars a year to play. So I'm assuming probably not too much more in 2007. But you're playing for your country. Yeah, um, it was pretty crazy that it went that sort of quickly. I made my debut in 2007 for the Aussies, um, and I think it worked in my favour. There was a um, military coup in Fiji which is where the World Cup was meant to be held mid-year mm. um, and because of that they ended up um, pushing out the World Cup to end of the year and changing it to New Zealand so making my debut in 2007 it also probably gave me a bit more time to be in that environment and have an opportunity um, and then yeah made got selected for World Cup which I couldn't believe um, at that point as well Diamonds, I don't think we were really earning much um, to play re or if really anything at that point. Right. Um, yeah, so it was was quite quite an interesting time. Is that is that the pinnacle or is Commonwealth game or what is is a World Championship the pinnacle or is a Commonwealth Games gold medal the pinnacle of netball? No, nah, World Cup. Um, obviously, netball we don't have the Olympics and Commonwealth Games is um, probably the other the other big one but i'd say if you spoke to most players they would certainly put the world cup ahead of con games is there a um, movement for uh, players moving teams to try and get sort of in the eyes of national selectors or so the international because i know obviously like some of the coaches are the then they're the coaches of the australian team so like 
is there sort of like I, I should try and move to say Queensland where I might get seen a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was quite interesting because at the end of the season just gone, you had 80 players who were off contract because the p- players' agreement hadn't been finalised yet. So every single player was off contract and there was so much movement. And the longest contract you can only sign is two years. So right. that's probably why there's, well, a lot of movement while I've played for four clubs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, but no, definitely, particularly when it comes, because these two years, Com Games and World Cup, back onto each other. Yes. Um, so you do, players have that mindset if to either make the Aussie squad, if they're already there, then what, is the best thing for them to obviously try and make a team and particularly a World Cup or Com Games. And um, I know a lot of girls would have been thinking about that around their decisions when they were off contract at the end of 21, where they were going to go to. And I'm not sure some of them have probably made the best decision. Really? But, yeah. Well, uh, and where does a premiership, where does a league premiership sit in that? Because you've won one premiership? Yep. Where does that sit in the rank of things that you want to do as a netballer? Oh, massive. I think, you know, for playing for the club, particularly for us with how it all works, it's where you spend, you know, 90% of your time as a player. Mm. Um, and that environment, you, you're giving so much of yourself to. And as you know, winning premierships is pretty um, amazing, pretty special, though hard to come by. Um, yeah, so certainly winning one is, um, yeah, the ultimate. It's, it's pretty special. Um, you've been, uh, I don't know if it's the, what is it, netball? You've been the president of the Netball Player Association. What's it called? What's the? What's the AMPA. AMPA. Yes. So you've been president, you were president for two, three years. Oh uh, yeah, about two so years. So interesting that you may have been <laughs> one setting the contract times by the sound of things. Well, what sort of, you know, this is towards the back end of your career, but, you know, I've, I've always respected you from afar and now, you know, uh, you're the partner of one of my best mates, so I clearly <laughs> know a bit more. But you know, I've always seen you as someone that's been honest, especially externally in the media, opinionated. And I don't say that in a bad way. Like you like, you know, you say it, you know, call a spade a spade, and you offered your opinion. So was that a natural, a natural, you know, progression into that sort of a role where you're effectively leading the players? You, you're the you're the forefront of player thoughts and feelings, basically. Yeah, it was quite interesting the progression to get to that role. I remember I just started in the Diamond Squad 2006 and that's when the Players Association had sort of started to emerge. We were aligned with the Workers' Union at the time. Right. Um, and the players, the senior players of the Aussie squad were like, oh, we need some young players. And they're like, Nat, you're going to go, you're going to be our, the delegate. Um, the young delegate, and I thought I'd been completely thrown under the bus, <laughs> <laughs> being the shit kicker. And um, so that's I had basically been a part of the Players Association as a delegate in some form from, from 2006, basic, almost, yeah, um, very early on. So, um, and then it just continued as I then moved from club to club um, and getting probably more of an understanding of how it all worked and, and things. And as you said, being someone that was – wasn't afraid of be having a voice and um, and that sort of thing. And then, yeah, ended up as um, president, which when we finally then merged out on our own um, and then created the board. So it was um, certainly eye-opening um, and obviously the things that certainly have transpired over the last couple of years has kept it interesting. Is that something that's been natural to you as a person, just, you know, saying it how it is or – is it something that you've had to grow into when you get a role like that in leadership? I mean, you've been a captain of your club as well, so leadership's not foreign to you, but is it saying something that's developed or? Oh, it's certainly something that's developed to some degree, but I also think it's come a bit natural. I think, um, I God, I even remember sitting in the car with my dad one time and um, I was quite young and he's like, if you've got a problem with someone, he goes, just be like a bloke. He goes, have it out, like talk about it. He goes, you might have a bit of a punch up. He goes, but then you're going to be mates. He's like, rather than girls that sit and bitch and complain and do nothing. And so I was like, okay, obviously there's no fist fights. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, he, Has it held true? It's, yeah, I think. And I th- at the end of the day, though, there's a way in which you can, if there's something that you do want to talk about or express, there's a way in a right way of doing it with still being able to get an opinion across or share your thoughts or 
whatever it is and then it's done and if people agree or you can come to a resolution or whatever, great, or you just – then you move on. Um, I, I'm i not a fan of all the – yeah, the bitching and complaining and everything and then no one actually doing anything about it. You have <coughs> you have sort of not been alone in that but you, you stand out from the crowd a bit in that sense. Like, I mean, you just said it yourself. Is that a, is that a female thing or is that – I feel like that's just your personality though, whether you're a man or a woman. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's probably my person. It's, it is probably my personality. There's just um, not. There's not a lot of people that I, you know, there's not a lot of females playing netball that I see with opinions like you. Yeah. No, um, and I think that I think there's certainly some players that are, but as you would know, when you're playing as well, a lot of the time you feel a bit hamstrung in terms of being able to have a voice because you are worried about what the repercussions are, and I know sometimes. People have asked, even coaches, like, oh, give us your feedback on X, Y and Z and you do that and they hate you for it. And it's like, well, hang on, you just asked me for my feedback. So, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> You sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 what do you want? Um, so that then just really frustrates me rather than, um, yeah, if something's fantastic, great, I'll say it. And on the other hand, if it's there's something that I think we could do better, then I'll say that as well. And for me, I think it comes from a point from – caring and I'm talking to Catherine Harvey Williams from the Players Association just recently um, with everything that's been going on I said I just want from my perspective I want to see our sport be better I don't want it to um, stay where it is or certainly go backwards which some you kind of feel maybe it is at the moment yeah. um, and I want the players to be respected and you know be getting what they deserve not getting paid a thousand dollars a yeah, season. Yeah, exactly right. So let's go back to you. I've I've gone too broad. I want to pull it back to okay. Nat Medhurst, the player. <laughs> so you're a goal attack yes. throughout your whole career. I start. Can, can, can you tell? Like, because like I don't know how many netball listeners we have, but I need some explanation around the role, like why you were good at it, <laughs> what makes a good goal attack, why you were never a defender. Because <laughs> I'm not <laughs> an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, I'm not on back chat. You can't be calling defenders idiots. <laughs> Oh, but you know, I have that typical out all forward, the time. Uh, typical <laughs> four issues. Oh, here we go. Yeah, look at me. There we go. Um, you guys couldn't handle what we do. Oh, yeah. Um, what, just, just, just get everything given to you and just, you know, kick the goals. Kick yeah. the goals. No worries. <laughs> you guys take one no, intercept or one punch yeah, and you're there you go. glorified. Yeah, this is, this is yeah. proper forward back. <laughs> T- tell, tell me about the position and, and why you played there, why you were good at it, what makes a good one. Um. Well, to back to your very first question, I didn't start off as a shooter, so I actually started off as a defender and then I saw the light and went, right. Of course yep. you're a defender. <laughs> you d- you, I'm sorry, Nat. You can't have the personality and attitude that you have without playing in the back line. You, you, you are a back woman, I'm telling you right now. You just don't know it. Okay. You forged uh, your career as a forward, but you're, I can tell you're a back. Um, so it's easy because it's an easy job. Um, <laughs> and then I... Played a little bit through centre, not much, and then, yeah, ended up as a shit. I don't know how. I think growing up country, you just sort of got thrown everywhere. And as you're doing netball, it's big on you play every position and um, and all those sorts of things. But, yeah, I'm not too sure exactly how I settled in as a goal attack, I th- possibly because of basketball and I was always a sh- shooter or um, shooting goals there. Um, and then, yeah, what was the rest of your question? What makes a good goal what attack? Why, goal why attack? were you good at it? Um, I've I've seen be- you, you, rev- you you not apparently you revolutionised the way goal attack was played, and I think I've who said that was that? Uh, well, I'm saying it right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. I've 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 seen it, and f- from what I've looked at, I think it's true. So I'm just wondering, from your point of view, what makes a good one? Like what? Um, you're one of the best to ever do it. I think for me. Um, I didn't, I, to be honest, I didn't have a lot of athletic attributes. So I wasn't quick. Um, I wasn't, didn't have a lot of power. So I wasn't good in the air. I had a good engine. Um, people think I'm quicker because of my timing. So my biggest strength would have been my court smarts. And I think as a goal attack and probably any attacking position, your ability to be creative, to set plays, to see what's going on, that was my biggest strength. And I had to change my game because the shooters as well, the sport evolved and particularly with getting in these huge six foot plus (laughs) shooters. And I know in general society, I'm actually quite tall, but on a netball court, I was midget. So even for a goal attack, um, 
And so I think that was something that really played into my strength, my ability to see what was happening to sometimes, dare I say it, almost a couple of plays ahead so I could find the space. I think that made me appear quicker than what I actually was out there on court. Um, And so that then allowed me to probably stay playing for as long as what um, I could. What's the relationship like between um, goal attack and goal shooter? So, again, like without breaking down netball rules, it looks like there's a big partnership between the two that are allowed to shoot on goal because there's only two people that can shoot, right? Yeah. You two. Yeah. (laughs) So that's an important connection, I assume. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was lucky with the girls um, around me from when I first – Started at Thunderbirds, there was a player called Kristen Heinrich, who any real netball nuffies would know. Um, and we, back then as well, that was very different because we were both quite a moving shooting uh, shooting circle. So um, that was really great. I then moved to Queensland um, and that's when the tall shooter thing started. So with Romelda Aiken, who's tall, giant Jamaican, sick, I don't know how tall she is, yeah. but she's 190-odd centimetres, 98 centimetres. Um, then Janelle Fowler at Queensland... Uh, here at West Coast Fever and then even in the Aussie Diamonds, Caitlin Bassett. So that connection was really important and I think for them, to be honest, they don't really have to do too much but for me I found my job was trying to set them up as much as possible to help get them in the best position. I never cared how many goals I shot, whoever shot them as long as we were winning. Yeah, so I was going to ask that because they can't leave the D, can they? And uh, the they, they, they've got a whole third. Oh, they can, they can okay, go out okay. that circle. But it always seemed like, uh, are they the big dog? Are they the finisher? Yeah, and the goal them. attack is the, you know, the the Robin to their Batman? Or like, what, <laughs> a, what's, little, a little bit. What, what's the, relate? like, are they, yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, are they yeah. the full forward and you're the centre forward? Or how does that work from In traditional sense? netball, obviously netball, the way in which the game's played with the introduction of new rules has changed it a bit. But... Generally speaking, like, yes, so your goal shooter is, like, your full forward, the, mm. the, the big dog. Um, and they're generally a lot easier to be able to target um, because they are generally so, so big. Um, yeah, so you just sort of roam around them and, and do what you need to do to, to help get goals. What about the um, goal defence then? Because you're always playing on that same person right so would you just have I mean with footy it sort of moves around a lot but these players are playing the same position every week so are there certain um, people that you just like can't stand because you see them so much (laughs) because they're not like swapping bibs around during the game oh yeah no there's definitely defenders that um you either didn't like or you just hated yeah hated (laughs) um there were some though that I hated them for different reasons just because maybe they were idiots or because of the way how good they were and so you just always knew that you were in for a really good battle um and so I really liked there was a player who I played with in Aussies Julie Corletto and she was an absolute freak of an athlete um we grew up playing all our netball together and just always loved coming up against her but it was good fun as well so there were players like um there was one girl I used to play against, her name was Rebecca Bully, and she was someone who you could sort of talk to a little bit because um, she could get quite frustrated. But I also hated playing against her because she was just so body on and had these bony elbows. And so I, I bruised like a peach, so I would come out of games <laughs> hate in bruises. Um, but, yeah, she was also good as well because you could sense when she was getting frustrated so you could just drop a few things and... You're a bit of a yeah. shit talker on the court. Oh, I'm not really a shit talker, but you could just say Typical things because you could get her there. You could see that she'd be getting frustrated at umpires or another defender or whatever it was. So you could just say what things. sort of what sort of things are you telling her? Um, I'm, I wasn't really a trash talker, but just um, if she'd be complaining to the umpires, then you just say something to her about being a better whinging and <laughs> getting on with the game and stop not a trash talk, stop pointing yeah. yeah yeah calling her, yeah yeah the the umpire player relationship i just get so many questions when i speak about things the, the, the umpire player relationship seems different to most other sports it's very authoritative than and you know there's no argue, you know one with like there's no arguing so people talk about umpire descent in the AFL <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a lot of descent in the netball right because if you do penalty against 
very whistle happy as well, netball umpires. Like there's a lot of whistles going on in netball. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of fouls, a lot of pe- – like there's a lot that – Fouls. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, is that wrong? Yeah. Okay, perfect. What are they called? Uh, contacts. Thank you. <laughs> perfect. Obstructions one. Obstructions, yep, yeah, good work. Um, yeah, no, there, well, how's this? So there was one years ago back in the old Commonwealth Bank Trophy League, there was a player – she was captain, Australian captain, Catherine Harvey Williams. She was sent off the court by the umpire because the umpire felt intimidated by how she looked at her. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, then I'll, I've got to share my story. So that was a long time. Netball's come a long way since then. Umpire but sent with their eyes. Yep, so it was sent off. And so you <sighs> can um, – but players, umpires can send the players off the court. So we've seen it's happened – it hasn't happened this year. It happened – Happened last year. It has happened recently. Um, it's happened in World Cups where players have been sent off the wow. court for a few minutes. Um, generally, it's done because out. the yeah. Is it like a time thing? Basically, like, yeah. yeah. So it might be for two or three centre passes or um, right. a couple of minutes. So are you playing a player down or yeah? So no, like you can't unless it's the centre. So you are always playing a player down. But so if the goal attack, if I got sent off, they have to play without the goal wow. attack. Wow. If the because. The play always starts with the centre pass. So if the centre got sent off, then you're allowed to shift a player to into that but position, still but you're down. still playing one down. Wow. I, that's a big disadvantage in netball. I mean, yeah. it's all about one-on-ones all over the court, so you suddenly have an extra number. Like yeah. I feel like you can just go pop, 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 yeah. pop. Yeah. I, um, I played mixed netball at Loftus Rec Centre. Here we go. Yes. And There's always a way that this you... This lady, <laughs> Maureen... Was the oh, was the there's <laughs> always a few of them in netball. <laughs> this um this um <laughs> this umpire and uh, she was yapping at me all game because I didn't really know the rules and I said I'm sorry I'm trying to learn like I'm trying to figure <laughs> it out and she was calling everything and I asked her can you explain that call and she um uh said something narky to me and I was like we don't need to talk to one another like, like that and I sort of went back at her and then at the end she she said that she was going to suspend me because I was intimidating her and I would just <laughs> I was just asking her the questions and then I went to the other referee and I was playing them off each other and I was like what's with Maureen she's like yeah she's always like that <laughs> so is there like this chip on umpire's shoulders like that or is it just a Maureen thing or is, yeah <laughs> like maybe a Maureen thing no I think um, obviously, at our level, it's very different. It's and the sport is so highly contested as well now. Um, and but I think the umpires obviously have a pretty tough gig. I think the thing that frustrates the players is that f- because it is so many of the rules are up to interpretation. So even from umpire to umpire and within your game, you can get umpires that will interpret the exact same play completely differently. So some might call it a contact. Some might. Cool, let the play go. So that is what a big part that then I think frustrates the players um, mm. with what's going on out there because, yeah, as I said, just whatever happens from one end to the other, with you, depending on what umpire you have, you can just get a completely different call. People think that it's a non-contact sport. How would you no, respond to that? bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's, it's proper oh, it's, contact. No, so it is. It's... It's now at our level, it's a contested sport. Um, but that's the thing. You can have two players going for the ball and two, they might completely take each other out and it's play on. Um, so there's a lot of body on, there's holding, there's a lot of stuff that happens off the ball as well that umpires don't see. Um, but, yeah, there's you get hit all the time when you're taking balls and you just have to either try and – stick your landing or get rid of it before you're done for then you get called for stepping or whatever it is so you know it's it's very physical the girls now the emphasis of um gym training is huge for the players this might have been you i just thought of it just then and i and it's come to me as i'm as i'm listening to you speak one year at west coast we had some west coast fever girls come down to training (laughs) with the back line only and teach us about footwork, right? And so as a footballer, it's just – I'm not going to sugarcoat you think, oh, this netball is coming to teach us about football and footwork. Like, awesome. This would be, this would be a, an afternoon I never get back in my life. <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, the Fair. girls came down and just tore us a new one. <laughs> it might have been, I don't know, just the footwork. It was like we did some drills that you guys would do and it was – we were so far out of our league within, in terms of the way you girls move your feet and the way you body position. And it was 
it was I think it was a couple of defenders and a couple of attackers because it's all about that, right? Your body positioning and where you you know, front shoulder, back shoulder, side side front. And so we did some drills. It was when Brownie was down there and, and <laughs> Shay was playing and like I just remember coming away going completely mind mind respect <laughs> levels from not zero, but just like I am a I am a piece of shit and netballers are genuine guns at your craft. Is that right? The footwork yeah. element? Footwork's huge. Um and everything that we do is because when you look at the space that the players yeah. have to work in and as well, particularly the mid quarters. So they've got lines, curved lines and things the where they're not allowed to go offside. Yes. Um you've got someone riding you generally the whole time. So often a lot of our drills are done in this tiny square box to yeah. get away from players. So, yeah, the footwork is phenomenal, um, so agile. And some of the players are so insanely quick. Like I don't know how they get free still watching them in the space that they do with someone basically guarding that whole yeah. entire space. And as you said, then the other big one is around your body positioning because – you're then also having to get the ball in um, a confined area, and because as well. it was it was because it was so small, that's why it was so good. It was you know, and, and putting that onto the footy field, it was enormously helpful because if you can do it, if you can do it in a shoebox, yeah. like you can do it out of the footy field, you're going to get fifty meters to do it. And yeah, I just I, I, I'd forgotten, but I remember coming away from that with so much respect from you know what your girls do. Um, can we go back on the world champs? So 2007, 2011, 2015, three Pete, four Australian diamonds. Tell us about that. Like you're at the top of your game, you win three in a row. Like it's incredible. Yeah. Um, couldn't – I still now don't even really believe that I was a part of that. Um, every single World Cup was so different in terms of it experience and I think my mindset as well. So 2007 I was just like, oh, wow, like <laughs> this is cool. What's this? It's a debut season. Yeah, right, exactly. Um so just sort of pumped to be there and like sitting on the bench was an absolute thrill. And then we beat to beat New Zealand in New Zealand in a World Cup is huge. Yes. Um, obviously that rivalry was absolutely massive and that was my fair I'd watched previous World Cups where that had happened. Um, but to be a part of one and actually really understand what that rivalry was about um, was phenomenal. 2011, um, Singapore, ult- incredible experience into extra time to win by one goal um I also at that point Sherelle McMahon who was our captain um she'd gone down she'd snapped her Achilles just leading into the World Cup so I was still probably the backup goal attack and then became I guess the number one um so that for me being that sort of player um and having that role was huge and then yeah 2015 to win on home soil was was pretty incredible um again against New Zealand I think they only won by three goals and and then it was after that as well I think I found out I'm one of eight who have done done that so um to be a part of a pretty sm- impressive groups pretty cool like I said Jason Dunstall <laughs> true <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I, I just to to win to win three world championships for your country. Winning one, great, like you said, but to do it in a row, it means you're a part of a dynasty, effectively. And it's every four years. It's not every year. Like to be able to keep coming back to the well over a period of over ten years, just um, you know, is it perseverance or is it consistency or is it determination? Like for you personally, um, I is it definitely. Culture? I don't know. What um. Is it? The, cu- the culture changed throughout all of them, yeah, but um, I would say for me, yeah, determination. Um, I think at the start, obviously, for everyone, the reason you get your opportunity may be f- for different reasons. Um, I think I obviously f- was incredibly lucky to have that opportunity, but to then to keep it and, to, as you said, to be a part of it then for another four another four years again after that um, – I guess I have to put that down to a lot of it down to me and and my um, work ethic, my ability to not get injured, which Butsy absolutely hates me for because <laughs> Sam he's Butler, the most <laughs> injured man in the history of the AFL, and I really did not get an injury throughout my entire career. So, so he's good. still even now if he does something, he's like he's like oh, you wouldn't know what this feels like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you just, just tell him maybe you didn't look after yourself. Yeah, properly. pretty much. More the, the yeah. elite athlete here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, as I said, I think big one, work rate and just um, – for me as well, I loved working hard and challenging myself. Um, it was pretty 
I love pre-season, weirdly, um, and just really seeing what I was capable of and, and then that thrill of match day to, to win was, was pretty awesome. So, spoke about you getting moved on from the Adelaide Thunderbirds. Sorry, I don't know a better word to use than whatever one's shafted. been. Yeah, I said sh- I said sacked before and a <laughs> shafted moved on. <laughs> so, if we can go to another period in your career, 2018, lose the grand final. F- sorry, yeah, that, I, let's forget I said that. Uh, you, you, you played in the grand final and it, something happened. <laughs> you lost. Uh, uh, but then you've got a, an option period on your contract. Effectively, yep. you'll know this better than I do. Uh, and then that doesn't get taken up again. Yeah. Yep. What's that like? Um, no, it was horrible. So I had signed a three-year deal. Um, in my mind, it was always a three-year deal with West Coast Fever. I had no intention of going anywhere. Um, and there was a opt-out clause for either party. Um, and as I said my full intention was to stay and it wasn't until reading it after that there was actually meant to be a month uh month's notice from either party if that was the case um it's like an, it's an employment contract effect. yeah um i was told one day before the contract expired that i was not wanted by the club and did not see it coming at all i ended up actually p so we'd played in that grand final um, I remember on the Monday, because what happens is the league puts out a list um, at the end of the season of all the players who are off contract to all the clubs, so then the clubs know who they can approach. And I started getting some messages from um, some of the coaches of other clubs and it was just, oh, like, oh, bad luck and blah, blah, you know, if you're not sure what you're doing next year. And I was like, I'm playing for the West Coast Fever, like, whatever. Yeah. And what is this? I'm like, this is a bit weird. And then a few days later, we had the um, awards dinner, Fever Awards dinner. And I knew that one of the other girls, um, because with the contracts, there's generally only, there was only like three shooters that were signed. And Janelle had signed. um, And that night I found out um, one of our younger shooters had signed a one-year deal. And then the next morning after the awards dinner, I got a text message from one of the players, a player in Melbourne, just going, oh, I've heard um, Alice Teague Neal, who's at the club now, has signed with Collingwood. And I was like, what? I'm like, what's going on? Like, yeah. this is just all weird. And so I ended up basically piecing it together myself that um, a meeting that I was having with the club on the Thursday evening um, was to them to tell me that they – weren't going to continue with me the following year. How was so, that meeting? Oh, it was horrible. Um, and as I said, because it was just the way in which it was done to give me one day. Um, and during that week, clubs were signing people. So I literally was then without out of job. Right. Because um, yeah, people had the jump on you effectively because you weren't looking for another yeah, job. Um, so I had no – and most of the clubs had started – filling up all their lists so um yeah it was horrible and just as I said because I had no idea I just bought I'd bought a house um a bit earlier a few months earlier um over here and just had no idea what I was going to do because I just there was no um forewarning that it was coming that reeks of unprofessionalism by the club so 2018 is the year that the salary cap breaching scandal whatever you want to call that happens yep is that all intertwined sounds like management didn't have their shit together. Yeah, pretty much, and that, and I think that was the thing um, afterwards because I was like, well, if it was after, a, a, if money was an issue, why was it that never discussed? I would have been, and I'm not just saying this. I would have been okay to take a pay cut if that's something that was needed. Um, but yeah, and then obviously afterwards, you found out that it was there was a salary cap breach which had started in 2018. Um, yeah, so it was all a complete. Balls up! Oh, I didn't know that. Obviously, as a player, I've got no idea what dollars and cents. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah. Like, uh, not not did you know? Because I assume it's like any other sport. Players don't know what's going on with nah. the books. But uh, what about on reflection? Then what's that sort of knowing that that the, the club was effectively forging the books and and paying people what they shouldn't have been paying? What's that feel like as a player who was in, involved at the time? And you know a lot of players that were too. Oh, um, I I couldn't believe it to be honest and. Yeah, it's obviously incredibly disappointing and I think 
you know, looking back now, particularly the girls who were then, who were still there and had been involved in those subsequent years because they ended up losing, um, because a lot of the, those deals were um, external employment things and... Um, yeah, and like, yeah, additions, yeah. Yep, yep, and other additions um, that hadn't then been signed off on or been put forward to the league. Um, so then those players ended up, losing out on well what they thought were genuine job opportunities and that were all above board additional money um that they thought they would have been earning um for then the following year when they still had a contract in place so yeah it's not great um and it obviously puts um a few question marks over your intention of why you would stay around you know a business that then is doing that to their players yeah it was kind of weird yeah i was just say so i mean it's sort of easy in hindsight to look back and be like i'm glad i didn't stay around at that time but do you feel that like that you sort of got lucky and that you didn't get involved in that sort of whole dare dare I say I'm really in a lot of ways we didn't win the grand final um knowing that because if we had you would expect that the league would have stripped the grand final off the club and the like at the end of the day it's the like the players and to have had that happen that would have just been absolutely horrible because um said what you go through to win a premiership for and sometimes it takes a bloody long time for that to happen um yeah i think that's probably a big relief that we didn't win that grand final looking back yeah that's an interesting thought isn't it because that you would have been stripped of it no doubt oh no doubt and a lot of people even sit there and question what the penalty if the penalty was harsh enough um for what was the penalty again it was a few hundred thousand dollars. Some of that, I think half of that was suspended. Was they th- then th- got... 300. 300, yeah. yeah. And they got ducted... 12 points. 12 points. But they still ended up keeping... They made finals that year. They Fever got to keep the, the same... Year. Yep, they got to keep... Um, well, the, yeah, when they... The season that they got ducted 12 points, they'd made that up within the first sort of four... Is well, it four, four points? It's four points Four points for yeah. a win, yeah. Yeah. So they were then, and they made finals that that year. Um, whereas I think it was at Melbourne Storm, they also then had to completely change their playing list. So a lot of people were wondering whether or not, um, well, they still kept the same team. Yeah. Um, was it severe enough? I don't know. Do you have reflections now that your career's finished, or can I ask this now? Is your career finished? <laughs> Is your car, is your career finished, Nat Meadows? <laughs> um, in the National League sense, yes. Are you making a comeback anywhere <laughs> no, in particular? It's, it's, oh, mate. Well, I'm just asking. <laughs> just I'm, no, I'm Samuel asking. Butler, we're having words. Um, <laughs> um, I don't. To be honest, I more so now. I've probably looked at my finishing my career with a bit of regret, um, and just wondering whether I did actually finish a year or two early. I do not expect or think that there is any hope in hell in me going back and playing National League netball. Um, But there's a part of me that would like to go back and play at some level, Um, yeah. What would stop you playing in the National League? Would it be speed? Would it be... I know, I think it'd be everyone else. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I I would 100% get it. I don't think... What am I? I'm nudging 30... I'd be 39 next year. You're not... No one would give that up for a young kid. Yeah. So you finish your career at Magpies, which is backdoored into COVID, um, which COVID, I don't, yeah, I don't really want to speak about COVID, but it's also um, you fall pregnant with your now son Edison um, and you've got a second Harriet now. So what's that time like at the back end of your career, stepping away to – Become a mother. Um, it was weird. The last year, so two thousand and nineteen, um, which was obviously my first my first year at Collingwood. Um, we knew we wanted a family, and for us to be able to do that, I needed help to fall pregnant. So towards the back end of two thousand and nineteen, I started um, a form of fertility treatment to try and fall pregnant, which obviously um, was successful, and then. Um, pregnant with Edison and with COVID it pushed the season back so then initially thinking that there was no hope in hell of me getting to play in 2020 there was then this glimmer of hope of going oh I might actually be able to actually play my career I play um, the season and I didn't know at that point if that was going if 2020 was going to actually be my last year thought 
fair chance it was. Um, so was trying to get back to play. Um, I ended up having an emergency Caesar as well. I was back training pretty quickly. Um, I was cleared to go to Queensland and play in the hub. Wow. Um, How long after you'd given birth? Um, this is about seven or so weeks. That's crazy. And <laughs> um, but we couldn't get yeah Sam up there. So and there was no way after everything we'd be, been through with COVID yes. um, over there, and then obviously with the young family to separate us and I would have needed a carer um, up there, which is what as a part of the pregnancy policy you do get. Um, a carer that's supported to go with you, um, with your child. So yeah, then in the end, um, and after a few few comments, then decided um, I was done. That's something that men don't have to deal with: stepping away from sport to, you know, be pregnant, be mothers. Do you have thoughts on that and the stresses involved for female athletes? Oh, it was. Um, yeah, it was insanely stressful and I think my situation was probably a lot different to maybe a lot of other mothers that have had to do it um, in a normal season. Yeah. Um, I had – there was no um, – all the medical team for the f- um, for Collingwood were either in the hub or our club doctor lived in um, Geelong and because of not being able to travel and all of those sorts of things, um, I was basically trying to go through it all on my own and get myself fit and um, and ready and all of those sorts of things. Um, and it, I think the thing that really hurt the most was with a women's sport, you would expect that you have the true genuine support of all the other women that are involved and that is actually not the case. So I know there are some people now that um, whether there's some people in administration that they don't get this or feel supported in being around netball with their kids there or travelling with them. Um, I was told um, that me going into a hub with Sam Edison um, and because there's obviously costs, even though that was supported, um, that I'd be ruining it for all future mums because of the costs incurred for me to go up there. And that was the biggest thing that they ended up breaking breaking me Mm. Um, and what ultimately said I'm done with this. Um, and so decided to retire. It sounds like you've had a lot of frustrations with hierarchy effectively of netball, and so that's to do with pregnancy there. But, um, you know, sele- selection and uh, rules and payment of players, you know, your role as president of the, I've forgotten, the AMPA. AMPA. Like, do you, do you as a whole look at netball and feel like it could be in a better place? Because I look at it and it's an incredibly popular sport, for especially for girls around this country, yet it doesn't sit where I think it probably should in terms of viewership and and popularity on the main stage. Can you speak to, like, netball as a whole and your frustrations with it and how it can be fixed? Yeah. That's a big question. But. Um, yeah, and I think that's the thing, being in it so much and from obviously just not only as your player but then, as you said, with Amper and probably having a bit more of an understanding of the things that go on and um, – some of the management and the discussions and the, all those sorts of things. It's absolute frustration to see that our sport is where it is when I think it can be so much more. Um, there's still a lot of questions around what we're doing with our pathways and um, where that is at the moment and what we're doing there. Um, obviously, our National League, which I love and I think it should stay the same in terms of having unlimited imports, but it's changing what then is coming through and particularly when there's other sports such as AFL, cricket, you've got women's soccer that are all doing so, so well. Um, netball's dropping off and we're still constantly saying, oh, we're the number one women's sport. And I'm like, are we? Mm. Because I don't think that we are and not with the leadership that we currently have and with decisions that are being made. Um, yeah, it just – I really question the health of netball going forward. Uh, can you – do you have solutions off the top of your head? How, how could it get better? How, how could they – if they aren't the number one sport, which I agree with you, I don't think they are anymore, how, how does it get back to that? I think they need to get back to what we're doing with our pathways. Um, a lot of that's fallen off. So in development in our grass, grassroots programs, obviously these other sports coming through, and particularly AFL, I think because they are new, they're putting so much more emphasis into grassroots sports, whereas netball I think is taking that for granted 
a lot more. And I think the biggest thing is even how we market ourselves at the elite level. We're targeting young girls and I'm sorry, but you see what's happening with the NBL in particular. It's very much an adult, but they still appeal to the young kids as well. But um, for a netball, that's like a whole market that we just don't really engage properly. Um, you adults. Know, adults. Adults. To come to our game and make netball a spectacle where, you know, come to the uh, elite game of netball and enjoy a few drinks and a night out and then go out in the town and do whatever like they mm. have with the basketball. It's, you know, they've got My Little Pony and which is, you know, great, great, for, the great for the young girls. But there's also a massive market of adults that actually mm. need to be engaged as well. That's interesting. Um Perth's going to host the grand final. <laughs> How about that, eh? Rumour has it, yeah. Perth is hosting the grand final. Now, for those listening that don't understand, the, uh, there's been quite a bit of noise in netball land this, this week, especially. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's always in one of the home club's states, right? Is that how it's gone in the past? Yes. And, and people know where it's going to be a fair way out. Now, this year, uh, without any consultation, I believe, with the players or coaches... Uh, Nepal Australia have effectively tendered out the grand final to different states in Australia. And Perth um, has, I think rightfully so, come out, <laughs> paid a bit of money, got the state government behind it and got the grand final here. So we may not see the West Coast fever in that grand final, we may, but it's unlikely given their standing on the ladder. So there's been a lot of controversy because basically the league just said, well, they didn't say anything. Right? They didn't, they didn't communicate. <laughs> they they didn't. just did what they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So normally the winner of the major semi, so 1v2, um, hosts the right. grand final. Um, so it's always been that way, except for the last couple of years like, when the hub. And you the win hub, the right to it's yeah, home ground advantage. Yeah. Home, gra- um, home ground advantage. Exactly right. And then two weeks out from finals, um, yes, Netball Australia throw this out there without any consultation. And the deal is only worth six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's three hundred grand cash, and almost half. And the reasons they're doing it is um, because of they're saying financial reasons, which I question. But then, if they're that cash poor, half of that money, almost half of that cash component, so that is going to players. So players have never been given um, or clubs a uh, winning fee or even a grand final fee. So the losing club's also going to get money. Um, but the, that need of cash that they've had to make this decision two weeks out and the way in which they've done it, that they're then going to give half of the money, the cash money that they get, to players. So why have they done it? I don't know. <laughs> and is that the issue? Because the players have come out strongly and... So, you know, so there's been a statement by the, by your players' association saying that we don't we don't want to be associated with the league effectively, like it's it's civil war. Yeah, it's, and it's big. Yeah, it's massive, and because these things have happened in the past as well. So there was the two point shot, which was brought in five weeks before the season started, which obviously impacts the players. No consultation, no consultation with clubs, umpires. Five anything. weeks out from the season. Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is two years ago. It. What? <laughs> yeah, and it never been practiced or trialed any in a preseason competition. That's or anything. ridiculous. Bang. Yep, this is what it That's is. That's not a rule change. That's a game that changes oh, the game. Ma- yeah, massive. And the way in which teams even recruit players because it, what sort of shooters do you want then for your team? Five weeks out, you yep. can't change that, right? But no. Nah, um, oh so God. that that was a big. Obviously, that's has sort of started it, and then there's been things over the last two years and then this one. So the playing groups completely um, had enough. They reportedly had um, a meeting on the Tuesday, which was deemed to be a consultation with the playing group, but the deal had already been done. So it was a presentation. Yeah, but they still concept, tried, yeah. but they still, yeah, said to the, no, to pre- the playing pre- group. This is what we're doing. Yeah. 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 No vote, just yeah. that's what we're doing. Yeah. Have a good day. So, well, the players were still in that meeting thinking it was a consultation and then – Afterwards, after the meeting, they found out that it was a done deal. Okay. Now, okay, we, we're okay. going to keep moving. It sounds like an absolute... Oh, I just, I just the, the two-point <laughs> shot thing. So you were playing at that time when that got introduced? Yes, I never got to play it because it came in in 2020. So I never played the 2020 right. season. Okay. But I remember walking out to a training session at 
um, Collingwood. I was obviously heavily pregnant. And I remember seeing this arc, this second ring, and I was like, what's that? And like, that's a two-point shot. And I was like, you're kidding me? I was like, shoot, goal, shooters should be shooting that with their eyes closed. It was literally like about a metre out. It was an app, it was so close. I thought that just makes an absolute joke. Had someone joke. like taped it on with a bit of masking tape? Yeah, pretty much at this point, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. they would have not, not known about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Right. So would you, were you a longer shooter or a shorter shooter? Would that have suited Yeah, no, you? that would have suited me. Right. Yeah. So you, you, you actually, even though it's a shit rule, you're like, why didn't you bring that in about five <laughs> years ago? I would have doubled yeah. my point score yeah, every week. Exactly right. <laughs> um, I just want to ask you about retirement and, and life post netball and like a total reflection on your sporting career. So you, you're retired now. How's post, net, for post netball <laughs> life been like and how do you reflect back on your career? You said a bit regretful to finish. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's probably been the last few months that I've looked probably back a bit more on my career and I don't know if it's been – involved in some of the the commentary and being around it and watching the game and I sit there and I'm like come on guys it's not that hard <laughs> <laughs> That's right. it's not that hard um that then I sort of get that itch and think oh god I wish I was still out pl- out there playing um obviously a lot of the other stuff I'm glad I'm not a part of but I really miss game day and being a part of that and it's just something that you, I don't think you can really replicate anywhere else in your life once you finish playing. Um, I've been really lucky, I think, since I retired. Um, I got to work with Com Games Australia, um, which was a phenomenal experience. First one out, because I think that was the biggest thing that worried me was, oh my gosh, what was I going to do if I retired? Um, and at that point as well, it was amongst COVID when it, there were so many jobs being lost. Um, so I was really fortunate with that and then even coming back here um, to Perth with job opportunities. But um, it's been interesting. I think every day, um, I must admit, nine to five, I've, I understand why people have Friday night drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. And you've got two kids as well. I get it. I'm, like, I'm so there for that. Um, and I was really shattered up and beat, was um, being pregnant for most of the last two years in being in retirement. I had an elite gin. Shut your ears, kids. I had an elite gin stash and it's all gone. And now that I can actually have a drink um, and it was all butsy. He, I was going to say, he, who stole that? <laughs> he polished that off. Um, but, yeah, no, I certainly understand, um, yeah, Friday night drinks and enjoying them. But um, my, I – look back at my actual playing career and um, it sort of blows my mind that I was a part of what I was. Um, There's certainly things that I wish at the time I probably didn't take, not take for granted, um, but was more present when I was there in those moments Um, and some of the tours and those sorts of things. But yeah, it was pretty remarkable to look back when you think of how many players still have played for their country for netball and to being one of them. Um, across as long as Australian netball's been going or international netball's, yeah, pretty remarkable. Give yourself credit where credit's due. You're one of the best to ever do a sport, ever. Mm. No. We are. Jason we are. Jason. You don't get to say no. <laughs> you are. So well bloody done. Oh, it's thanks. a great career. <laughs> Fucking great career. Now, unless you got anything else, we've got something for you. Social oh. media. Oh, God, I've been hearing about this for years. Social media <laughs> yes. is exactly right. Everyone's Four heard years. about it. <laughs> Nat, Nat hit me yeah. up actually. I said, oh, can you, we'd love to have you as a guest. And she's like, only if we do social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. You did not say that. Right, so this is where. All right, uh, go Yeah, this is where we, we get the people to ask you the questions. We've Dan and I have done our best, but realistically this is for the people, by okay. the people. It's, yep. It's, yep. it's an amazing segment. Well, cameo, cameo. F- Kindly come Be- on board. Yeah, than yeah Cameo's sponsor. looking after us. Uh, we'll do the quick shout out to Cameo, but we'll move on from uh, Hyper Buddicles isn't... Hyper Buddicles has is not no. been continued. And <laughs> it's big it's featured at, once in the last year. Big Batch Outs fans will be absolutely giving you severe credit for that because <laughs> there's been a few people calling for it. But I did ask Butsy about Hyper Buddicles when he came on and he couldn't remember what the segment was about. <laughs> yeah. So that about sums up how good that segment yeah. was. I, I read it out as I was reading it, Hyper Buddicles, and then they <laughs> both were like, oh, God. Hyper Buddicles. Yeah. All right, very good. So, social media, let's get into it because I know you have to be out of here by... In about 10 minutes, yeah. I think. Oh, I don't the know. Time How long we chat the, time, the time you told me. I just, I'm just trying to feign what time we're recording okay, this. Okay, great. But the time you told me is 10 minutes away. Okay, cool. Is we're it, all good. Is that a hard out or are we... No, we're, we're good. Okay, good. Yeah, Have we're it. good. All right. 
T double underscore dizzy triple underscore. We give extra points for underscores. Okay. <laughs> uh, who would make a better netball player out of Will or Dan, and why? Oh, um. She, she <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, maybe make a, case, make a case for uh, Dan. Yeah, and then you I tell think it, well, it depends on if there's Maureen um, umpiring. That might <laughs> that might set you back. You, you might be Dan? out of what, play. What position would he play? Um, you'd you'd be through the mid court, so I'd probably yep. need to test your skills. Although I was going to say, people probably think a wing defence, but a good wing defence is hard to come by. So I don't know if you've got any so defensive game to you. I, like I, I see in goal defence. That's my sweet spot. Goal right. defence. Oh, okay, right. How do you feel about that, Nat? Goal defence. I'm concerned about yes. your stature. Yes. Vertically Mate. challenged? <laughs> yeah, no, it's the, it's the leap. It's oh, the leap. you got the hops, right. Yeah, it's okay. about positioning though, mate. Yeah, positioning, the you leap. You say you were a short goal attack though, so maybe... Can, you can jump. Okay. Uh, white Could. man, white yeah. man cannot jump. We'll, we'll, start, we'll start you on the wing. I'll, we'll I'll start you on the wing, and we'll see what you can do. Play a lot of basketball, so that's yeah. Okay. I feel like the, yeah, anyways, where would anyways. I play? Yeah. I'll back line. No, no I'm like, going to put you out of goal attack, and I'm no, going to no, no, and no. let's just see what you can do there. I'm never playing offense forward. My days as a backman will continue. <laughs> uh, Jess Flay underscore. Uh, was there any warm up slash? Uh, practice drill you absolutely hated during uh, doing over your career oh static stretching um i hated all warm-ups i just found them really boring the jogging up and down the hamstring stretches just all of it just wanted to play i just wanted to play i was like <laughs> let's just get to the good stuff yes, i love that underscore laura dot may underscore <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Butsy for the inside Butsy Goss. Is he really a loud peer? He seemed to lack that particular courtesy previously. <laughs> okay. So. Do you need a bat? No. Okay, so okay. I saw, well, I, I did because I saw that question come through and I screenshot it and I said to Butsy, I was like, explain yourself. And I was like, and how does she know about you peeing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. And how- he said it started something about Duggo being a loud peer because he just, he's like, be a gentleman and don't go straight into the yeah, water. Yeah, look, we had a big debate on back chat, OG back chat, about where you actually wee. Where you target, toilet. yeah. yeah it's, is it the back Is it the back corner? Is it the back wall? Is it in the middle? And Butsy was speaking about in the middle, like forcefully <laughs> loud. And proud. Forcefully <laughs> loud. <laughs> And so it went for like a month about Butsy's P regime. So that is what uh, that is what Laura is talking about. Yeah, well, so he had, no, cool. he's saying that that's rude. It's incredibly rude to do that. All oh, right. So yeah. So, so he, uh, uh, oh. yeah. So and like, I can't say I'm really lurking around the toilet when he's <laughs> when that's, he's that's, there. So um, that, that, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. That's very fine. good. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, st- 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 thank you for the clarification. Um, no, we'll just yep. answer that. Maga. Yep. Three. <laughs> Maga two. Is that, that, oh no, <laughs> Maga one is taken. Sorry. Uh, Sorry who is your favourite person from Gawla, South Australia? <laughs> Anyone that's not him. <laughs> it, 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 Ma- Ma- Maga is a friend of Sam Butler's who's yeah. from Gawla. Did, It'd be have, his wife, Lauren. Like, there you go. Ma- Maga shouldn't have even got a birth on this. The underscore Jade. He'd be happy with that shout out. Underscore Jaden. Uh, what is something great that WA has in which Victoria doesn't? Beaches. Right. Sunshine. <laughs> Sunshine. <laughs> the sun <laughs> in general. Oh, that's very good. Uh, uh, let's see what you like with this. Taz Pratt's first one. Okay. Uh, what would your social netball team name be? Oh. That's a hard one, actually, off the top. You got any plan? Like, yeah. Is that a, is the that hyper- a thing that people the do? <laughs> in, in social netball leagues, do they go with like netball puns, like the nets or something? Oh, oh that's not even a pun. Like um, Nats, ob- Nats Nepple Nuffies. Nep- oh, yeah, Nats, Nats Nepple Nuffies. Okay. Did you say yeah. Nuffies? Yeah, Nuffies. Right. Yeah. That, I Good. love that. That's perfect. And then the last one from the same person, Taz Pratt's. Uh, what is sideline commentating like? You've been, you been, been seeing your head on TV a bit. Yeah. Hello. Getting on there. Um, it's good. Um, I enjoy it. It's um, it's a lot hard. I remember the first time I was involved in commentary, and I don't know if you would say the same, but from the outside, it's pretty easy to th- you just go oh, that looks easy anyone could do that why yeah. are they stuff up or blah 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 um and people will bag things but it's yeah it's pretty pretty intense um and the commentator's doing a phenomenal job but i'm enjoying it and it's good to be as i said in and amongst the action and and seeing what's going on i feel like a right 
creep hanging around the huddles to try and listen in. Yeah, what's that like? <laughs> because you've been out there. I know, and I'm like, they're sitting there probably just thinking, just wanting me to bugger off and I'm sitting there sticking my head in. Do you get much access? Do you get much player access? Um, they're actually pretty good. So they generally, like when they have their huddles during the timeouts or breaks, they generally let you in pretty close. But yeah. I actually feel, I feel awkward. I'm like, they don't want me sticking my head in there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the clubs are actually pretty good. And I think this year with what um, broadcast is trying to do the clubs are giving a lot more access it so. does look better from afar it looks like it's it's better coverage um yeah like i said i've sent your head up there a little bit which is probably a positive i'd yeah. say a very yeah. good positive oh, thank you but it's a weird feeling hey yeah I, I feel the same when i'm out in the field i do the specials and stuff for fox and it just feels weird like interviewing a player out in the ground yeah the first time i did it i actually had this like it was actually exciting for me i don't know <laughs> I, I do feel weird but i also I was interviewing, I don't know, Jack Steele from the St Kilda captain who I'd played on. Like, and so it shouldn't have been exciting, but I was like, oh, I'll get to interview the <laughs> yeah. St Kilda captain here. Like, hello. And I, I, just, real football tr- player. I yeah. just try not to say the real cliche, annoying questions that you used to get as a player and be like, really? You're asking me that? Yeah, do you use that? Because you're writing for Code Sports as well. You're write, very successfully writing for Code Sports, I might add. Yeah, oh, thank you. Your name um, comes up in meet and daily meetings <laughs> quite a lot. Do you try With to do that? With my fellow writer? Yeah. Do you try and do that? That player element, you know, try to use your 17 years of experience in the games to actually write opinions that are player orientated and asking players those sort of questions too. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the beauty of, um, and Batsy and I have spoken about this, um, around having someone who hasn't been long out of the game because you do have a very different perspective and insight and you still, I guess, feel quite connected to the game and what's happening and you see things differently so um yeah it's good i think to be able to actually sh- shed a light on that side of it rather than being so far removed which is good this one's a good one t double underscore dizzy triple underscore it's back for another mm. uh, what's mad monday like oh um depends on the club but mostly it's pretty tame i must admit um really yeah, there's like there's not a lot of end of season trips that ever really happen. Um, it can be pretty loose, I must, <laughs> but I don't think nothing like what football ha- does. Yeah, yeah, you've got the unique, you know, experience yeah. that you know what Mad Monday is from a football sense. Well, at yeah. least as a partner that you don't yeah. see about to you for quite a long time. Yeah, so I just it's generally I must the big ones that I've had. I've always only just been after a World Cup. Like, they've been loose. They've been good. Any, but any even stories for us? No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> just 12 girls, loose. you know, <laughs> hanging around. Um, look, we've lost – there's players who have been lost. Um, yeah. It's, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like in international <laughs> countries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't name the player. Tell me about – don't don't say the player's name. Um, we had to send a player home because she was – Far too intoxicated, far too early in the night and then didn't want to go home. Ended up jumping on the back of a scooter, taking off from the players who were taking her home and they had no idea where she was. For how long? Oh, not until the next morning. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But found. Found and with a um, way her then... Finding a, a a love note from someone <laughs> that she didn't remember was there. Oh boy! Yeah. Okay. Yep. But she's alive and kicking. Alive okay. and kicking. Very good. Yep. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, this will go last. Last one. Tash Robinson. Uh. Sure. Yep. What was your biggest failure in netball, and how did it help you? Oh, biggest failure. Um, to be honest, probably. I think what happened to me in 2009 with leaving this strange sort of failure one, but leaving Adelaide Thunderbirds um, was really hard and the way in which I left wasn't great and I think that had a real impact on me. Um, As I said, there was a lot of things that I struggled with, but um, in terms of me then leaving clubs, which as you touched on at the start, I played for fi- quite a few. It then just made me very, um, I think, self-aware of how I wanted to then leave relationships um, and then going forward. So that was probably the biggest thing. Adelaide Thunderbirds, I think, it was really horrible. Um, it was quite a hard thing for me to then move on. So I didn't want to l- 
have that happen again. Um, yeah, so even I know people say a lot of things around with what happened with West Coast Fever and still when stuff happens, they think that there's a lot of resentment that I have and I actually don't even irrespective of what actually happened and those relationships with the people that were involved like with Stacey who was the coach at the time they're great and I think that was a very deliberate thing from my end to make sure because to help me move on and just get on with business it's good mm. if you're going to play for anyone would it be for West Coast Fever like um, if, you, if, oh, you, if you mounted a comeback oh I'd, I'd 100% play for West Coast Fever yeah, is it is it a zero percent chance that you come back and play in the? Like what, have you started level? doing oh, stuff? Like are you getting I'm down out, to the court and? Oh no, no, I'm out running and doing stuff. And um, but he's put a ring, but I think that's more for his enjoyment rather than mine. Netball ring at okay, home. So you're running, and then you're gonna start shooting soon. Two pointers. Yeah, yeah two pointers. Um, the chances of me playing national netball are zero because okay. whilst I, as I said, I sit there and I think I can play. Yes. The coaches would be go. We don't want this geriatric. Imagine if she just made a comeback though. Imagine if we could just put that to one percent. <laughs> bought her back. One. It could be we'll one. Go one. I'll give you one. Yeah, we got a chance. <laughs> You're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> all right, Nat. Uh, that's all we got time for. Thank you so much. You've had an incredible career. It's been a great chat. You, your microphone talent has been mm, on next point. level. Oh, Better yes. than Dennis Kennedy. That's all I've been thinking about, guys. Um, and you are now. Well, it's it's always beneficial, but you are the. Highest echelon sports person in the Butler household. <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, great achievement. Um, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. It's very much thanks to our sponsors, mm. who I forgot to mention off the top of this show. So I'm going to have to remedy, remedy that. Whip a snap of whiskey. A little bit too early for a whiskey right now, but that's <laughs> yep. okay. Uh, Shelter Brewing Co. Again, a little too early. We love them, but a little too early. Uh, Blue Bet, our betting partners at Blue Bet. Might have to start working a couple of little netball multis in. We get some we get some inside word from that. Um, she's heard them in the middle of the huddle, so we get that working <laughs> along. Cameo Australia, who I don't think Nat's on yet. We might have to sign you up. And Margaret River Roasting Co. Our, our coffee providers. Not too early for a coffee. Yeah, we did have we did have a couple before. Beautiful coffee. Um, thanks to all our sponsors. You know where to find us. Backchatpodcast.com.au. You can send us an email. Hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. Find us on socials. Backchat double underscore. <laughs> Uh, And um, that's it. We're done. Sign up to Patreon. Find us on YouTube. Bye-bye.